I have to be honest with you today. There were times in the last week I did not feel blessed. It's been a busy couple of weeks. We've had family in. We've had musical concerts. We went to. I've been praying for a sermon. We've had friends over. There, there's been all kinds of things going on. And, you know, it's like once some of the COVID effects were lifted, everything comes rushing in. And I, I just felt like I was spinning out of control for quite a bit of it. I, may, maybe you have been in life and it was like this whirling dervish that was going on and you just couldn't grab hold of what you needed to grab hold of. The thing that really struck me and the scripture we're using today is the one from Ephesians. Love John the Baptist, but let's, let's not dwell on it. It's, it's hard to say uh, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, when you're talking about someone's head being cut off, let's be honest. But when Paul was writing in the book of Ephesians, where was he writing from? He was in prison. And if anybody had a right to feel imprisoned because he was a Christian, it would have been Paul. And so I kind of related to the feeling of, of, of being overwhelmed. But there's something very interesting about this section that's in the Greek that isn't in the English. In chapter 1, verses 3, four, three, three through 14, the entire section is one long it represents not so much a reasoned logical statement as it does a lyrical song of praise he was caught up in the glory of God's salvation in Jesus Christ and just couldn't stop writing once he started he was overwhelmed by what God has done for us regardless of circumstances both his and ours so let's take a quick look heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him let's stop there for a couple of minutes the wonder of this section to me isn't that we chose God because he chose us before the foundation of the world to be in him and to be holy and blameless now those are two very important words so let's take a look at those the first word is holy in the Greek it is hagios and it's not a religious word it has nothing to do with it what it means is separated set apart so you have a birthday your birthday isn't different from any of the rest of the days of the year but it's set apart for you because it's your birthday. We have religious holy days. They're different from the other days, not because they're sacred, but because we set them apart for a particular meaning. We have buildings where the church gathers. And it's the same thing as it is for the holy days. They're set apart because they're set apart for a purpose. Hagios, holy, set apart. Here's the challenge that the modern church has been very slow to face. See, in the early church, Christians knew that they were set apart. They were different. That was why Paul was in prison, is because he was preaching the gospel of Christ. So different, in fact, that a lot of them were killed, and they were all hated by people who were not Christians. But the tendency of the modern church has been to play down the difference between the church, the Christians, and the world, the non-Christians. A lot of times we've basically said to Christians, you really don't have to be that different from the world. 
but the difference should be in the way we behave in school, in our job, and even when we're partying with our friends. There's something that sets us apart, and that something is the love of Christ. We are to love unreservedly and accept all people. The truth is, in with, is within each of us. And if we became hagios, set apart, holy, then we would revolutionize society. The second word is blameless. And in the Greek, that word is amamos. Now that's a very specific word. It has to deal with the sacrificial animal that was used in, when, when the Jews came together and did their sacrifices for the Passover. So let's consider the sacrificial system just for a few minutes so that we can better understand. The first sacrifice recorded in the Bible is in the book of Genesis. Now we don't see that sacrifice, we only see the results of that sacrifice. God prepared animal skins and he covered Adam and Eve. That's in Genesis 3.21. God himself sacrificed the first animals in order to provide clothing and a covering for Adam and Eve to protect them from the elements and nature. After this, we witness humanity moving away from God and forgetting about God, and they start worshiping natural things. Well, I mean, it's kind of logical, isn't it? The, the sun comes from above, rain comes from above, the wind seems to come from kind of above or from somewhere, and plants grow if it comes in the right amount. So what we need to do is name whatever's in control of those, and we'll offer sacrifices to them. And so they would get into this ritualistic sacrifice of offering to the sun, of offering to the rain, of offering to the wind. Now what happens if you offer these sacrifices and you get an abundance of crop? Well, you can't offer the same amount, can you? Because the gods gave you more. And so you have to offer extra. And so you might offer two animals this time. It's a catch-22 because what happens if you offer the sacrifices and the rain doesn't come and the sun comes out and there's a drought? You have to offer more sacrifices to try and appease the gods. What if that doesn't work? Well, it would get to the point they would get themselves in a frenzy and they would come up to the altar and they would cut themselves and they would drip their own blood because if the animals aren't sufficient, maybe the gods want me. And what if that wasn't sufficient and the drought continued? Well, the followers of Moloch actually built this huge metal statue with arms outstretched like this. And they would get this huge fire going in its innards until these hands glowed red and they would actually offer their children as a sacrifice on those hands to try and appease the gods. Now let's fast forward to Moses and the book of Leviticus. Nobody likes the book of Leviticus, okay? It's full of sacrifices, it's full of do's and don'ts, it's full of all these different stipulations and the measurements of the temple. But the first three verses really sum it up. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. Did you hear that? That he may be accepted before the Lord. All of a sudden, you don't have to guess anymore, am I pleasing God? He lays out for you, do this, and you will be accepted by God. Now, as archaic as you might think the sacrificial system is, and it is, 
you can appreciate this revolutionary notion that God gave to bring people forward. You can know that you're accepted by God. And just like the animal, we are to be without spot or blemish. The word is blameless. So we're not supposed to be respectable. I'm sorry. We're supposed to be perfect. We're not supposed to have any sin. We're not supposed to have any bad thoughts. We're not supposed to have any bad actions. We're to be perfect. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. But no one can be perfect, you might say. Let's consider what the word perfect means. It is the same word as complete. So what Jesus said was, be complete as my Father in heaven is complete. Be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. How are we made complete? By Jesus. By the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Not only does Jesus save us, he completes us. And how does he make us complete and perfect? Let's keep reading. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses and sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in heaven and on earth in him. Paul says we're adopted as sons, so let's hit that first. Why does he say we're adopted as sons? Is he being sexist here? Paul's always accused of being sexist. He is not. Because Paul is writing from the first century legal understanding of adoption. You see, in families in the first century, if there was an inheritance, only the sons received the inheritance. Daughters received nothing. They were expected to get married and have their inheritance or have their, their way made with whoever they married. And so what Paul wants us to understand, because he's talking to men and he's talking to women, you were adopted as sons in the legal sense of the word. In other words, you men and you women were adopted as sons and you received the inheritance of God. When someone was adopted in the first century, it's not like it is today, they would take the child in, they would pay whatever sum it was to the family that they got the child from, and then all ties with that family were cut off. The child was considered a new person. They had a new name. They had a new relationship. They had a new family. It was to the point that even if there was a great sum of debt owed because of this child from the original family, the birth family, that debt was wiped clean. Now how do we become perfect and complete? We're adopted by God. We take on his family name and his family likeness and all of our debt to sin is wiped clean. We were all incomplete and indebted to sin, living without any eternal hope. But Paul writes, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The sacrificial system in the Bible that began in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis is completed by Jesus on the cross. And Jesus took this to a whole new level because his sacrifice showed us that God is a God of love, that we can know God on an intimate basis and he loves us. 
And this is the mystery that Paul talks about. Because if you don't know what Jesus did, if someone who had never heard of Jesus walked into this service and we're taking communion, the elements mean nothing to them. It's a mystery. You walk in, you listen to an old man speak, and you sing songs in praise of a Jewish carpenter who was executed 2,000 years ago. If you're not a Christian, what sense does that make? It's a complete mystery. We've been shown the truth of the mystery of God that was hidden from the beginning of time. That God loves us and wants to spend eternity with us. So much so that Jesus clothed us in his righteousness the same way God the Father clothed Adam and Eve in skins of animals to protect them. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the gospel and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory." Now this is Paul's first example of unity in Christ because he talks about us who first believed. He's talking about the Jews, his nation. He says when you hear of the word and you believed, he's talking about Gentiles, people like me and you. And then he says together we have received our inheritance, Jews and Gentiles together, people who formerly hated each other and wanted to kill each other are now brothers and sisters in Christ. Then he talks about being sealed in the Holy Spirit. Of course, in the first century, if you were sending something, you placed a seal on it to show that it was closed, closed and had not been opened and to whom it belonged. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And he says further than that, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of salvation. In some translations, that word is translated earnest. You've heard of earnest money when you're going to buy a house? The Holy Spirit is our earnest money, is our guarantee that God has saved us. So if you've had a rough week, if you've been so busy that you can't seem to find what you need to do, you just can't grab a hold of it, If you want to just pack up and move away from everything, like, kind of like I did in the last week, then talk to God about it. Ask him for help. And an amazing thing will happen. You will find out that the events and the circumstances of this life have absolutely no effect on you. Now, does that sound silly for someone who's a professional counselor to say? The events and circumstances have no effect on you. What does have an effect on you is the emphasis you place on all those events and circumstances. And I'm here to tell you, if you look at it from the viewpoint of God, and all he has done for us. Then you will be able to praise God. Regardless of your circumstances. Even if you're an apostle in prison. Amen.